When we use a digital service, first we have to agree to the terms and conditions provided. If we don't agree, we have the choice not to use them. Apple, Google, Facebook, they pretty much all say the same. And that, in essence, is that they own every piece of data, including the account, and they can do whatever they please with both. So in October 2015, in conjunction with my exhibition Data Shadow, I gave a talk at the University of Cambridge's Festival Ideas titled Anonymity is Our Only Right, and That is Why It Must Be Destroyed. At the end of this talk, I shared all my login details with the audience. This included my username and passwords for my personal and professional email addresses, social media accounts, Apple ID, and my closed online banking details. Since in the eyes of the terms and conditions to which I agreed to, I never owned these accounts, giving away my passwords was the only way I could think of deleting them. Just as writing over a note a few times before throwing it away makes it harder to read, anyone who was or is still using my accounts, as continues to be the case with Twitter handle at Mark Farid, is helping write and associate new but incorrect data to the virtual Mark Farid. This marked the beginning of my six months attempt to live without a digital footprint. I spent the first three weeks without a phone or computer, but what proved very apparent very quickly is that as a 23 or 24 year old living in London, it's now impossible to opt out of the use of many digital online platforms, let alone the use of using a mobile phone or computer. In the 21st century, you simply can't exist without them. I spent the remaining five and a bit months using three different laptops and multiple pay-as-you-go phones. Each laptop had its own very specific purpose, only used at specific times and places. I encrypted everything I did, and I used VPNs to say that I was located in Germany or Bulgaria. Every month, I would place my phone, SIM card, and by extension, my friends, limiting the potential for any third-party tracking. So if, you so if you had my phone number for one month, you wouldn't have it again for the remaining five, and this included my family. Any accounts I needed to make were linked to different, individual, unlinked pay-as-you-go SIM cards. I changed my bank accounts, and I paid for everything with cash. I bought daily travel cards, and otherwise, I attempted to live life as normal. But in my attempts to raise my digital footprint, my cultural, social, and financial life were all affected in negative ways, along with my mental stability. At first, friends would make the effort to come and knock on my door, but since I wasn't in, that quickly stopped. And when I was with people, I may have been more invested in building more genuine, personal connections with people, but they still had smartphones. And when I wasn't with people, I became very aware of just how alone I really was. But the personal isolation wasn't the hardest bit. Undoubtedly, the cultural, isolation, the cultural isolation was significantly worse. Though I maintained the ability to go on the internet, my news and cultural references became increasingly exclusive, with the nuances of culture, humor, and wit becoming impossible to maintain, which limited my capacity to interact with others. I think most of us take for granted the extent to which we are all defined by the media. As individuals, a source of information, such as the news, offers a perceived empowerment, providing us with the illusion of cultural awareness and the sense that we've independently reached reasoned and rational conclusions. The media that we engage with typifies not just our social class, but acts as the lens through which we see our immediate society's function, along with the wider world around us. Whilst cultural influences such as art or film influence how we interact, instructing us how to comfort, joke, and even seduce one another. In the 21st century, we encounter these media influences through our social media news feeds, or algorithms, which are tailored and mediated forms through which we consume politics, entertainment, and culture. We're able to build strong relationship with family, friends, and partners, not regulated by physical distance. You know what's happening in the world, in culture, and you know where you fit into it. 18 days into the project, on 13th of November 2015, the Paris attacks happened. Without technology, my experience of it was very different to everyone else's. Despite a noticeably somber mood in the city, it took me over 24 hours to find out that the attacks had happened. And whilst politically, it was a watershed moment, the thing which really struck me is how little it was mentioned by people in the physical world. There was coverage in the paper and on news channels, but outside of that, Culturally, it seemed to predominantly exist online. Signs of solidarity and support overwhelmed social media news feeds, with users filtering French flags over their profile picture, and testimony after testimony could be read, heard, and watched by anyone with social media. But if you didn't have social media, it didn't exist. 
Now, I don't mean to belittle or diminish the significance of the awful thing which happened, but rather to highlight the ability of social media to focus attention and determine the scale, impact, and circulation of cultural events and news, of, and news moments. So by February 2016, three months after the attacks, I was finding the cultural isolation was becoming too much. Although work was going very well and I just returned from Rossum Film Festival, I was finding it incredibly difficult to interact with other people, to read cultural and social cues, and generally be in the presence of other people. I was becoming a difficult person to be around, pushing the very few people that remained close to me away, and began to develop a dependency on drugs. In a very simplistic way, one drug replaced another. So when the end of April arrived, I was incredibly happy. I, I could re-engage with culture. I could use one computer instead of three, all from the comfort of my own bed. Everyone could have my phone number, arrange to meet up with people, and best of all, when I did arrange to meet up with people, I could be late. <laughs> Life is not any much simpler when we just click I agree, but it's happier too. And as the boundaries between the physical and the virtual world tip further into the hands of the virtual, it's worse to resist the change than to engage with it, as the alternative really leads me to believe that there is no choice. Our social media accounts act as our social passports into the real world. They allow for a commonality under a guise of individuality, which is what we all crave. Although you must be at least 13 years old to, use, to have a Facebook account, a BBC report published in 2016 stated that 79% of 10 to 12-year-olds have a Facebook account, with some users as young as four. 79% of 10 to 12-year-olds are not only in breach of Facebook's terms and conditions, but it's rationalized by a desire to fit in with others and not be different. And when the 21st century demands an ever-increasing connectivity and efficiency in the conduct of our lives, having a standardized platform, or social passport, if you will, becomes undeniably pragmatic. But when social media by necessity breeds conformity, taking contrived outward appearance as the basis for interaction, it forces us to see ourselves as others see us, giving our projected self a constructed image of who we want to be, a dedicated space to exist. We can play, and we can play up, censor, and reform this image until we're happy with it, and we can do so over, with the luxury of time. But when we're aware that our actions are digitally documented, it allows us to judge ourselves to the limited and categoric reactions of our peers. And when our sense of fulfillment is derived through the number of likes our projected image amasses, our social conduct on all platforms, which includes real life, becomes increasingly driven by the needs of our virtual image. So, six months after Data Shadow began, I returned to technology for four months and conceived of my next project, Poisonous Sandstones. Poisonous Sandstone saw me broadcast all of my personal and professional emails, text messages, phone calls, web browsing, Skype, and social media accounts in real time online. Any photographs or videos I captured appeared on the website, and my phone's locations were updated every 20 minutes. We also took some of the adverts that were targeted to me from websites I visited, which were all shown on poisonous-antidote.com. Alongside the online news feed, in collaboration with design and programmer Vicente Gasco, we wrote a program to 3D print each day's data, forming 31 unique and adjoining parts each day of my digital life. And together, these formed my expanding digital landscape, which was exhibited at Gazelli Art House in London throughout September 2016. For the first half of that month, I found that I used my phone and laptop as normal. If I noticed a change, it was that I grew in confidence, that I spoke to people more, sent things that I probably wouldn't have otherwise sent, and indulged my idiosyncrasies. It's worth noting that up until this point, I'd only been digitally interacting with people only through phone calls, text messages, and emails. Meaning, everyone I communicated with, I immediately knew, which meant that I could depend on them to understand and contextualize my actions if they were to go on the website and see my digital footprint. But on the 15th of September, I made Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts, and became immediately aware, anxious even, of some of my prior arrogance. You know, some of the explicit texts, I'd pictures I both sent and received, ignoring certain people, doing whatever little things. Suddenly I was hit by the realization that everyone could see everything. This realization was particularly acute with Facebook. I was made aware that even my most distant acquaintances, people I hadn't seen in 15 years, shared equal access and were judging me without any real context. 
If I spoke lovingly, aggressively, or boastfully, whoever they were, best friends, mortal enemies, or funders of a project, at best, they would only be guessing. For this reason, it was in the second half of the project that I noticed a more tangible and conscious change in my behavior. On waking up in the morning, my phone and computer weren't the first things I'd look at because I didn't want people to know what time I woke up. When I did use the internet, I would either reply to my emails and messages straight away or check the news to read up on cultural and educational things whilst making a very conscious effort to read less about football. <laughs> when I was working, I didn't procrastinate digitally anyway because I knew everyone could see. I became very aware of my locations and I was at home a lot, so I made sure that I was going out and seeing people, going on walks, visiting museums, going to Belgium at one point. I spoke to my family more often, and despite them living in Leicester, saw them more regularly than normal. I was on the internet less, I was more productive, and I was enjoying myself more. So unlike with Data Shadow, when I gave up online privacy only to realize that social media is essentially indispensable to contemporary life, Poison Santo allowed me to embrace the publicness of social media. Subsequently, I found that I was sub that I was consciously and subconsciously changing my actions and behaviors to ensure that I conformed to society's ideologies, that I was doing what I was meant to be doing and felt validated, validating the knowledge that people could see it. And that's the thing that surprised me the most. From October 2015 to October 2016, the period in which I tried to live without digital mediators, came back to technology and then broadcast everything live. The month in which I had no digital privacy whatsoever was the happiest period for me. And for me personally, the days that directly followed the end of Poisonous Santidotes were the most revealing. What would I choose to do when I had privacy again? I sat in my room, alone, claiming that I didn't want to be around people and didn't want the pressure to perform. I read basically everything on the Leicester Mercury, about football anyway, stared blindly into Netflix and scrolled endlessly through the void that is the World Wide Web. And what's worse is that over the month that followed, I distinctly remember leaving events early and not doing certain things purely because my actions weren't being broadcast. The validation of fulfillment when I went out in the evening for a few hours, wherever it was, knowing that to the outside observer, I appeared to be socializing, placed my virtual self at the center of my real world experiences, which allowed me to judge my actions and opinions through the potential reception of my newsfeed. And that's the problem. This perception of myself, which is constantly being validated whilst giving me a sense of empowerment, is extremely dangerous territory in regards to individuality and notions surrounding the self. The confirmation that Poison Sand Soap gave me could only be fulfilled by further consumption. And as I used the platform more, each post, action, and interaction meant that I became more reliant on it to fill the growing void that it created. Publicly broadcasting my online activity may appear to represent some dystopian future. But the truth is that most of us are doing exactly this right now, albeit in a more limited way. We're constantly self-publicizing the details of our lives to technology companies, to governments, and to our networks on social media. The difference between you and I is of degree, not kind. And as we continue to give up more and more personal data, governments are gaining further legal access to it. In June 2016, 444 MPs voted in favor of the Investory Powers Bill or Snoopers Charter, opposed by just 69 MPs, which to me seems fairly indicative that the general public no longer really value privacy as a protected right. For those of you that don't know, this means that the UK government now has the legal right to access the last 12 months of your browser history, intercept and read all forms of your communication, and even switch on your phone and laptop's microphone and camera. But if we take the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of privacy as a state in which one is not observed or disturbed by other people, and anonymity as a state in which one is unidentifiable, then privacy and anonymity are fundamental human rights for they ensure that one's validation comes from within. Without the fear of social reprisal, they enable to one to live instinctively, protecting the self-validation that's innate to the individual. Without privacy and anonymity, our freedom of speech is destroyed as our freedom of thought is restricted. We're encouraged to conform to political, social, and philosophical ideals through the veil of self-expression, instead being replaced by a hegemonized and globalized cultural identity. We become subconsciously and consciously habituated to the potential of not only being watched, but held accountable at any time by family, friends, and authorities. And whilst human beings have always been conscious of the judgments of our peers, the amount and depth of information we now give them is unprecedented in human history leaving individuality to shrink further and further into the shadows of conformity. 
In a world where we auto-publicize our digital footprint 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, I can't see how something fundamental won't change in the human psyche. And if I'm being honest, I already think it has. Thank you.